Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning to the US, to Amy. Um, so it's a pleasure to have all of you with us, all participants, colleagues, students, distinguished guests. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you tonight at this uh, CPD webinar, which is on law and technology, uh, inviting us to reflect on uh, current issues together particularly the uh, latest developments, not only in Cyprus, but also uh, in the European Union. And of course, now we have to add in the UK, separately from the European Union and in the USA. So before I will introduce the topics very briefly, um, let me uh, first um, uh, welcome our speakers, our two speakers, and thank them very much for the willingness to uh, assist despite the distance, the time difference, because for Amy it's uh, just, you know, very early morning and technical constraints. So we very much look forward to listening to them. I would also like to thank uh, our colleagues at the university, Andrea and Costas, who have assisted and are still assisting with the organization and the smooth uh, running of the of the webinar and all participants across frontiers. I can see alumni of ours, I can see students, I can see good friends of the school. So this is very, very encouraging. Please be reminded that the webinar is recorded for the purpose of widening access to educational resources such as this one. If you have not returned your consent form uh, or the additional information that are requested from practicing lawyers for CPD purposes, please do that as soon as possible because we will be submitting uh, the list of attendees to the Cyprus Bar Association. Please keep your cameras off and Microsoft off, uh, microphones off at all times and you can use the chat function uh, in the MS Teams to, to communicate with us during the Q&A. If you do not wish to appear at all on the recordings, then don't even use the MS Teams, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, refrain from engaging in with communication, in communication. Can I please remind you that uh, all the speakers and other participants who will ask questions will take part for educational purposes, and this is an educational setting, which means that each participant will provide verbally electronically or otherwise, uh, whatever they will provide must not be accepted or interpreted as either legal advice or any form of advice. You may view materials at your disposal in the MS Teams classroom, which uh, you have access to. And please use them with the necessar necessar necessary acknowledgements. Uh, we will be able to distribute the slides <clears throat> later on to whoever <clears throat> would like to Get the slides. Um, <clears throat> let me just take you to uh, the program tonight. So that's the program from now on until 8.30. I hope you can see my slides. So uh, I will give a brief introduction and then uh, Amy and Stilianos will cover uh, various areas that are of interest to all of us, including the latest developments, but also uh, COVID uh, and uh, data transfers to the UK, um, standard clauses. Um, we will try to give you a very short break. We'll try to. We'll also try to wrap up and, uh, and give you, you know, a little bit of uh, assessment, uh, uh, food for thought. And there will be a Q&A session. We are aiming to, a to end at 8.30 sharp. Let me just take you to our past and current expertise in the field of law and technology at the school. Uh, we were very lucky to uh, host on two occasions uh, the president of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Once in Nicosia, uh, you can see the place, it's the, it's the amphitheater of the Hellenic Bank. And the next day on campus at UCLan, Cyprus in Pila, uh, and on both occasions, we actually listened to the uh, president of the Supreme Court and the president of the Court of Justice of the European Union and the judges, the Cypriot judges to the CJEU, discussing the protection of personal data. So uh, the students also benefited from this experience, as well as the public uh, for the events at the Hellenic Bank. 
We gave uh, last year a series, as, as the school, we gave last year a series of uh, seminars, not webinars, but seminars on law and technology. And uh, one of them was on artificial intelligence. The other one was on blockchain technology. And the third one was on privacy. Again, it was the same speakers, uh, Stylianos and Amy. So we're happy to be able to do the follow up, uh, despite the fact that Amy is, is now far away. She's back home. But, you know, thanks to technology, then we are happy to be able to uh, hold this webinar. I also wanted to take to bring your attention to a, a major research project. This is a Horizon 2020 project. Please switch off your microphone. Whoever has the microphone on, we can hear you. There are people who are not muted. So this is uh, um, an Horizon 2020 project, uh, which is called Sherpa. So if you if you Google Sherpa project, you will find it. And this is a project to which uh, Ukraine Cyprus participates through its law school and the School of Sciences. And is entirely dedicated to artificial intelligence, big data and human rights. So uh, if you would like to get more information, you can always get in touch with me. Um, so before I give the floor, I may give the floor to our speakers, let me just say a, a few words uh, by saying that, uh, of course, we are global citizens and we are all law professionals or providers of legal education. And we find ourselves at the forefront of the protection of personal data, either as data owners, as data controllers, but also simply as data users. At the same time, we are subject to multiple mandatory requests for exchange of information at every level, national, European, international level. The UK now forms a new jurisdiction for the transfer of data, which professionals in Cyprus ought to pay a lot of attention to, but not only in Cyprus. Uh, this is therefore a fine exercise undertaken by professionals in Cyprus and beyond that must take into consideration the fast development of technologies, phenomena such as globalization, but also external factors such as the Brexit or the pandemic, which affect the way professionals operate. And it is in this context that uh, the series of issues will be addressed tonight by our two speakers, whom we thank very much. But before I may give them the floor, let me just say a few words about the, 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 the avalanche of legal instruments at the EU and UK level that unfolded at the end of December 2020, having an impact on law and technology, as well as on the legal profession and digital uh, education. So the main EU-UK uh, legal instrument for our purposes tonight is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, which covers areas such as uh, trading goods and uh, services, digital trade, intellectual property, public procurement, law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. All of those are fundamental issues uh, for lawyers. The EU-UK agreement uh, concerning security procedures for exchanging and protection of classified information, which is another agreement under the EU-UK deal, is also of, of much relevance to the legal profession. But for tonight, we will look at the provisions of the TCA. So the principles of the TCA are derived from uh, international trade law and the rules of the internal market as negotiated by the European Union on behalf of its member states. It is deemed to be an EU-only agreement, which means that the European Commission has been negotiating the agreement on behalf of the European Union. These principles are equal treatment, a level playing field, fair competition and sustainable development through a, fair, a, through a free trade zone. These are very important principles, but they are not the subject of tonight's um, uh, webinar. These principles are aimed to minimize uncertainty and disruption to businesses and, and, and citizens, but are only applicable to the extent that the integrity of the EU single market and the EU legal order, as well as the indivisibility of the four freedoms are not affected. And this is so much relevance to data flow. 
The TCA is a quite ambitious free trade agreement uh, that entails commitments for open market access, the protection of workers, consumers, the environment, climate change, and tax transparency, but it remains a free trade agreement. On the 1st of January 2021, the UK lost all the rights and obligations it had as an EU member state and during the transition period under the withdrawal agreement. In particular, uh, apart from Northern Ireland for goods, uh, rules of origins, uh, customs formalities, checks and controls apply for goods and there are equivalent principles for services, capital and people. The free movement of data is no exception to the rule. It is, however, more difficult to control the movement of data and services, or even capital, than it is to control the movement of persons and establishment. So express rules are needed to address privacy, data protection in digital trade, but also the flow of data between the EU and the UK, including personal data in various sectors. And you will find provisions on uh, users' data, uh, pass passengers' data, registration data, and so on in many parts of the TCA, uh, such as in the PRUM part, the law PNR part, the Europol, the Eurojust, or the exchange of information, AML, and CFT parts of the agreement. Uh, general provisions are contained in the common and institutional provisions on the scope of data. And uh, there is a specific article in that uh, general section. In the services and investment parts of the TCA, the serving so-called parts of the TCA, there is a whole uh, chapter on digital trade and cross-border data flows, including uh, two provisions which I have uh, reproduced here, articles uh, six and seven of the digit part of the TCA. Uh, they are very important reads for whoever is dealing with the transfer of data and the protection of personal data, which is, of course, uh, all of us. These slides will be made available to you. In the law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, part of the TCA, so the law gen, there are provisions on the protection of fundamental rights, including data protection, Article 4 of the law gen in particular, which you have here which is a very long article, uh, which reflects some principles of the GDPR. So uh, again, we will be talking about those tonight. What did I want to basically show you uh, by showing you those slides? First of all, uh, some elements for tonight that, you know, certain principles are not applicable anymore, such as, you know, the free flow of services, or the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, not applicable anymore. And I wanted also to raise uh, the issue or introduce the issue of data flow and protection uh, under the EU-UK uh, deal, which uh, our speakers will develop. Now, two important findings of the TCA itself. First of all, the data flow and the protection uh, of personal data, as well as digital trade, especially in times of COVID, have been given a very central place in the TCA. And this is something to be noted. It is also to be noted that uh, lawyers have been, have been given a, a fundamental role to play in the TCA as well. There are quite a lot of principles that apply to lawyers. So the principle of open data applies, but we are talking about a third country here, the UK. So processing and exceptions in the name of the protection of personal data will be necessary. At present, uh, data can continue flowing to and from the UK, provided the UK abides by the provisions of the GDPR and pending a long-term adequacy agreement, which will end the interim period we are in. Hopefully there'll be no delay with this. If the UK, however, amends its data protection rules during that interim period, there is a risk that the interim period will end. And uh, this uncertainty combined with the impact of the pandemic on the flow of data uh, render this webinar very timely. So let me unshare my screen now and uh, basically uh, give the floor 
to our speakers for the first part of the program, which is on uh, recent legal developments in data protection, including data protection authority enforcement actions, legislation, regulation, and court decisions, particularly SHREMS 2. Uh, who would like to go first? I'm happy to, or Stelianos, if you want to, either one. I can talk about SHREMS. I think Stilianos oops, has more um, sort of fundamental information about the nature of personal data. Very good, Amy. Do you have your slides that you could share? I do. Good. Uh, Thank you. Do you need any help with this? I may. <laughs> no, we can uh, see your slides. Perfect. You can see the slides. OK, good. Let's see. We can. OK, I, I apologize because I'm much more familiar with Zoom than Microsoft Teams. So thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. This is uh, a very, very timely uh, webinar um, because the field is changing all the time. So I'm going to focus on the SHREMS 2 decision which revolves around data transfers outside the European economic area. Uh, the focus of the SHREMS decision was uh, use by Facebook, of transfer by Facebook of personal data from Facebook Ireland to Facebook US. But the impact of the decision is going to affect data transfers regardless of where they go to outside the European economic area. So in order to legally transfer personal data outside the European economic area, the receiving country, the third country, either must have an adequacy decision, be subject to an adequacy decision, or the data exporter, which is usually the controller, must ensure that there's an adequate level of protection of the data in the receiving country, which they refer to as the third country. So the adequacy determination is a decision by the European Commission that the laws and practices in the country are substantially equivalent to the protection of data, of personal data in the EU. And adequacy determinations have been made for Argentina, Canada, with respect to commercial organizations, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland, Uruguay, and some small jurisdictions. Um, we'll talk about the UK adequacy decision status uh, later in the webinar. And South Korea is in the process of having an adequacy decision reviewed. Adequacy decision, uh, adequacy determinations are subject to review at least every four years. So just because you get an adequacy, adequacy determination doesn't mean that, that you're off the hook forever. So if there is no adequacy determination in your jurisdiction, such as in the US, the data exporter must ensure that there's an adequate level of protection. And we have typically relied on several mechanisms. Um, the most common one in the US was the US EU Privacy Shield Framework, which was put in place after the prior uh, Safe Harbor Framework was invalidated by the first TREMS decision. So there is a pattern here. Um, under the Privacy Shield, companies could certify, self-certify that they were taking certain steps to track and protect data. They had to agree that they would be subject to a dispute resolution with an ombudsman in the U.S. Um, and they, it wasn't, I, I would say it was GDPR light. Um, and over, I think over 5,000 U.S data importers had signed up to the uh, Privacy Shield framework. Other common mechanisms to determine that there's an adequate level of protection 
are the standard contractual clauses, which we will also talk about later in the webinar, binding corporate rules and specific derogations. So the binding corporate rules only apply to intra-company transfers. So the company that I was at um, before I retired was, had, was a global company, had operations all over. We negotiated binding corporate rules with a data protection authority in the EU, I believe it was in Ireland, uh, that established the rules under which we could transfer personal data from within the EU, primarily employee data, uh, to other, to, to affiliated organizations within the US. So it's only intra-company, it doesn't help if you are sending your data to the US for Facebook or to, or to AWS or Microsoft or anybody else. Specific derogations are getting a lot more um, interest now because as a result of the Schrems II decision, the Schrems II decision, as we'll talk about, impacts the use of standard contractual clauses and binding corporate rules, but does specifically does not impact the use of derogations. The trouble with derogations is that they're very limited and really don't apply to the vast, I would say 95% of the, or more of the data transfers that are going on. So there's a, an ex, a derogation for specific informed consent. So you have to inform the data subject that their data is being transferred to an, a jurisdiction that does not have an adequate level of protection and that there won't be an adequate mechanism for, for protection. Um, and the data subject can, can revoke their consent at any time. Um, there's a derogation for data transfers that are necessary for the performance of a contract, but this is only for use in occasional situations, and there has to be a very close connection between the, the contract and the need to transfer the data to the third country. So, for example, a travel agent needs to transfer hotel reservation information to the location where the, the traveler is going, that level of necessity. And the third possibly applicable derogation is compelling legitimate interest, and that's even more restrictive. So if you can't find any other um, mechanism for transferring data to the US or to any other country that doesn't have an adequacy determination, look at derogations, but don't, um, don't hold your breath. So the Schrems II decision, it overturned the US EU privacy shield. It upheld the validity of standard contractual clauses, but it certainly weakened our confidence in using them. So the it overturned the the court overturned the US EU privacy shield primarily because of concerns about US government surveillance, um, as demonstrated by Edward Snowden's leaks of the various means by which the National Security Agency was um, surveilling, uh, was collecting in information. Specifically, the court was concerned about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, and an executive order. The, the issue is that those two mechanisms are actually more, in my view, they're actually more limited in scope than what was portrayed. So they, the FISA applies to electronics, um, electronic communications services, electronic communication service providers, which certainly includes Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, certainly with respect to meetings and WhatsApp communication services, but it probably does not apply to many of the routine transfers 
that are being done for processing data. So it's electronic communication service providers, not all electronic data processing. Secondly, it does not allow surveillance of US persons. US persons includes US corporations. It includes communications to US corporations. So many, most communications to the US, certainly if they are coming from a US affiliate in the EU to the US, are actually protected under FISA and the executive order. But this was not addressed in the Schrems II decision. So what we're left with is the court determining that the US did not have practically effective protection, adequate pr effective protection for personal data. So it leaves a, a big, a, a lot of uncertainty. Um, they also pointed out that the ombudsman mechanism under the US EU privacy shield was not effective. The ombudsman didn't have, um, the, the mechanism didn't provide a real mechanism to resolve um, disputes and the ombudsman worked for the Department of State, which was really not uh, independent, which I happen to agree with. So the, the privacy shield has been deemed not an adequate measure of protection anymore. What that means is companies can still use the privacy shield, they can still use standard contractual clauses, but on a case-by-case -case basis, they have to do an assessment of each transfer to determine if the circumstances of the transfer and the legislation and legal system in place at the time can provide essentially equivalent protection as is offered to EU subjects under the, the uh, general data protection law uh, regulation. So it is a very burdensome, uh, it, it has introduced a tremendous amount of uncertainty and fear uh, among data importers in the US. So let's talk about So what do we do? So the European Data Protection Board issued some recommendations, some uh, frequently asked questions and some guidance on how to, what kind of assessment, what kind of supplementary, uh, supplemental measures can you put in place to ensure this adequate level of protection? The real key is to be very clear about what data you're transferring, where it's going, and how it's being protected. So the best um, the best advice is don't transfer it to a company that's going to end up transferring it to the US. That is much, much easier to say than to do. Um, the issue that we have is that all of our cloud computing uses so many um, subprocessors for all the, the various processes that I've been in the situation where under the standard contractual clauses, you have to identify any third parties that are going to have access to the data, any of your subprocessors. So the company I was with was using uh, Microsoft Azure. So we would go to Microsoft Azure and say, okay, since we're hosting data on Azure, what subprocessors do you use? Okay, they you get a very long list of subprocessors. Then you have to figure out where are those, what subprocessors do those subprocessors use? And it becomes almost an infinite loop. So the idea of doing this assessment is very daunting and especially for the 70% of um, 
privacy shield data importers in the US that are small and medium enterprises. Um, this is this is a, a very difficult situation for them. So if you if you cannot keep your data within the EU, uh, then you need to do a transfer impact assessment to understand what data is going outside, what, what data is going to the third country, let's say the US, uh, what their legal system, how their legal system protects it, um, and what additional measures you can put in place. And you need to document all of this. And you need to review this, I would say, at least annually, because both laws and the type of data and tech technology all changes so quickly. Um, the EDP, the European Data Protection Board guidelines um, included some supplementary measures in Annex 2. There were technical measures, contractual measures, and organizational measures. But what the EDPED, uh, European Data Protection Board, made clear was that if you're transferring data to the US, simply putting in place contractual and organizational measures will probably not be sufficient. You really need to be looking at additional technical measures. This is primarily around very strong uh, encryption or data uh, anonymization or pseudonymization. So uh, that's very easy to say and much harder to actually accomplish. So this is, um, companies are struggling with what they're going to, how they're going to um, deal with this. Let me show you, there's, if you are responsible for assessing the adequacy of protection in the US, I strongly recommend these resources. We have the SHRIMS 2 decision, the FAQs, the recommendations for supplementary measures. The recommendation of essential guarantees is the legal protection that the European Data Protection Board is recommending. Um, there's guidance from the European Data Protection Supervisor, which applies only to European Union institutions, but provides a, a very good roadmap for what would be considered an appropriate review. And I also highly recommend these two documents to help you understand the US, um, the issues in the US and why the FISA may not be at the carte blanche to intelligence surveillance that it was portrayed in the Schrems II decision. Uh, the first one in particular, Alan Rawl is um, uh, one of the leaders in privacy in the US, and he wrote a very um, cogent argument for why and how the um, concerns raised by the Court of Justice of the European Union were overblown. Um, so I'll just mention that one of the um, some of the interesting consequences of the Schrems II decision. It either means that um, that company in the EU may have less access to services from the US, from, from US companies, uh, especially from smaller and small and medium enterprise companies, which may mean that there is less um, access to innovation. Um, it may also mean that it will be a, a boost to um, the, to, it will encourage companies to set up data centers in the EU. So if I were advising my former employer uh, we provided a hosted managed uh, cybersecurity service, and we had a lot of interest from companies in the EU, um, but we could not afford to set up a separate data center in the EU at the time. 
So I would have been advising my client that they had to either decide that it was worth it to set up a data center to keep all the data in the EU, or they had to give up the EU market. So one possibility is less access to innovation. The second one is it will boost uh, EU data centers. Uh, the third one is that it may possibly finally push the US political system to upgrade our woeful and patchwork of data privacy laws. And if there's enough pressure on the big tech companies, um, they may exert the political pressure to get privacy reform underway. The trouble is that they are under, there, there's so much suspicion of big tech right now that they are not seen as champions of freedom or good practices. <laughs> so, um, and we've certainly had enough political turmoil in the last four years um, that reforming our data privacy, our data protection laws is really low on the um, priority list right now. So that, that in my mind would have been the, the best outcome is that this would spur reform in the US, but I don't see that. The, the other option, the other probable outcome is that it will dramatically um, enhance development of privacy tech. So we're seeing a whole new industry of companies and privacy management and new ways of handling tracking data. So I, th I think that it will encourage future developments because the the where we're left with the standard contractual clauses and the case by case assessment is not feasible. It's, it's not yeah. workable. So what's happening however Amy because some states in the in in in, in the US are much much more ahead than others. Mm -hmm. How can we bring uh, the protection to uh, an equal level. I mean, you, you're talking about the U.S. as a whole, but some uh, states are clearly more, uh, you know, uh, personal data protection friendly than others. Right, right. And and that's part of the issue is that we have this patchwork. Mm -hmm. So California is definitely at the front, at the forefront. They just adopted in November um, additional enhancements to the consumer privacy uh, law in California that will take effect in 2023. There's talk of California requesting an adequacy decision. Uh, so not the US, but California. Wow. <laughs> is this possible? Yes, it is possible. Um, practical, I don't know, because data doesn't stay in California. You know, it gets sure, especially because of because of the principles of redundancy, you don't want your data stored along the San Andreas earthquake fault. So, you know, we always made a point to have a data center on the West Coast and a data center on the East Coast. Um, that's why we have to have national protection. I mean, it just, it, it's it's not, not feasible to have 50 different schemes which we currently have, we have 50 different uh, requirements, actually 52 different requirements for data breach notification. Um, it's it's uh, not, not workable. <laughs> it is, however, a full employment act for lawyers who specialize in an area, in a growth area. Um, I highly recommend getting certified as a um, certified professional, a certified privacy professional with the um, IAPP, International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, it, you definitely have um, a lot of work available. So um, are there any, do we want to do questions now or wait until later? Uh, I think, you're perfectly on time to start with. So I think we should listen to Stylianos that has about like 
15 minutes and then we will see what we do if we give a break or if we answer questions yeah okay thanks thanks amy it was very clear so um well we've been discussing about technology that uh, technology has uh, uh, <laughs> brought us closer however things with technology is that they're technical so they get weird however again uh, one has to appreciate the fact that um, it is due to the technology that we are today here and everybody sitting at their own uh, offices or houses. Amy is in the States and we still have uh, the opportunity to do this uh, live webinar. Um, of, of course, if you ask me, I would prefer the seminar rather than the webinar, but still under these challenging times, technology has helped us a lot. Um, so in my turn, I will speak about uh, the GDPR in Cyprus and uh, any changes or important facts that occur the past year. Um, Stefan, I'm not sure if you're sharing or not because I'm on the phone. But you are, okay. So I'm, I'm sharing right now, okay. Okay. So, so you will need to tell me when to change slide. I will do. OK, now it's sharing. Great. So um, in uh, back in 2018, after the implementation of the GDPR on the 20th of May, the Cyprus uh, Parliament has passed the relevant law, uh, which uh, whose purpose uh, was is to implement the provisions of the law, therefore uh, if, one's, uh, if one reads this law, we'll see that most of the articles refer to the articles of the GDPR. Um, the second purpose is to enhance the penalties. Um, uh, as if it was not, not enough that the GDPR was providing for those huge penalties of millions, uh, our parliament has also imposed criminal liability to the persons who do not adhere to the provisions. Um, criminal liability is uh, uh, related in uh, when there is an unlawful, unlawful transfer of data, when there is an unlawful publishing of data. Uh, there's also criminal liability, which is fined of up to uh, 30,000 euro or uh, up to three years imprisonment if uh, uh, an enterprise which must have a data flow mapping does not actually have a data flow mapping, which is the number one deliverable as per the regulation that every enterprise should have, or if that, uh, that data flow mapping is there but is incomplete. So it is uh, very important to understand that the Cyprus uh, parliament enhanced the, the Cyprus society has uh, uh, embraced uh, GDPR and was happy to make it part of the local leg legislation. It obviously defines the law, what is the personal data, because you know what you're protecting, because if you don't know to distinguish the personal data from anything else, then the problem is that you don't know what you're, pro what you're protecting. And if you don't know what to protect, you don't know how to protect it either. The second major importance of this law is that it provides for the legal grounds for processing. It says that basically no processing of personal data is allowed unless there is a reason. And the GDPR or the law provides exactly which reasons are these, and there are six. And lastly, it provides for the basic principles of processing, which means that how why we process data is one thing, how we process the data is another thing. And the answer to the how is we process personal data in a way that would also guarantee better safety. Stephanie, can I please change the slide? Thank you very much. So it defines personal data as any information that may lead to the, uh, the identification of a, of a physical person. So any information, any information that may use in any way 
directly or indirectly that may lead to the identification of a physical person that is considered a personal data. Stephanie, next one, please. The grounds for legal processing are you are only allowed to process personal data. When I say you, I mean I refer to the enterprise. It is if it is necessary for the performance of a contract. We widen up a bit this wording uh, that it is necessary for the performance of a contract to say that it is necessary for the performance or the provision of a service, of any service that the enterprise needs to offer to a, an individual. A second ground is that the enterprise has a legal obligation in order to process the data. Uh, a common example, just to give you an idea, is uh, uh, processing the social insurance number of employees. You have to, not because it's part of the contract, but because it's part of the regulation. Third one is the protection of the vital interests of natural persons. Uh, I didn't have many examples to give you, but today, due to COVID, uh, there are examples. For, uh, um, for example, an enterprise needs to log who is, who is coming in and who is going out of the company. Or why? In order to be able to trace that person in case there is uh, COVID within the enterprise. So what do they do? They will, at the reception, they have a logbook where everyone who enters the enterprise is uh, writing down the name, who is going to visit, the, the, the telephone and the address for the sole purpose of the protection of the vital interest of the natural persons against COVID. The fourth um uh, ground for legal processing which is the one which is uh, rather misunderstood because most people are confusing this with the previous legislation is the consent at the previous legislation the consent was given in a wider format at this legislation now the consent is just it's just a supplementary ground so basically consent it is a ground for legal processing. One enterprise may use consent as a means to process data. However, however, must know that since the consent may be revoked by the individual, the consent cannot be used for a main purpose, for a main processing, but only for secondary purposes. For example, uh, if I need to uh, uh, if I need to share um, uh, corporate events through Instagram and Facebook, and because the corporate events will bear the photos and the comments of uh, the employees, and because that is a processing of personal data, as if somebody will see the face or the comments, and because that does not fall under the obligations that are created under the employment agreement, if the enterprise wants to do that, it means that it needs to obtain the consent of the employee. The next uh, ground for legal processing is the performance of a task carried out in the public interest or in the exercise of public authority. This relates mostly to uh, requests coming out from authorities like the police, like regulators of various professions, like uh, the income tax department, the labor office, who ask for information about certain incidents. So that's the ground for an enterprise to provide data, but one must not remember, must not forget that because the obligation for the provision of this data relates to the enterprise itself, the enterprise must be sure that the 
authority that is requesting data, it is requesting data for a purpose, and the data that are requested are not in excess of the purpose. And the last one is the processing that is necessary for the purpose of the protection of the legitimate interests of the uh, enterprise. Protection of the legitimate interest, it goes just as the wording says, to protect uh, to protect the interests of the company against claims or against um, obligations that may arise. So it, it is only for those six grounds that, as per the law and the GDPR, uh, processing uh, may be made. Um, the next slide, please, Stephanie. Should you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to engage into a conversation or to answer any questions you may have. Once we have identified as to why we process data, the next thing to do is to understand that the, the, the personal data must be processed in a certain way. So they have to be collected for a specified and legitimate purpose. Specified purpose means for a single purpose. And that purpose has to be legitimate. Legitimate means that that purpose is one that is supported by one of the six legal grounds mentioned before. So those data must not be processed in any other way apart for the purpose they were collected for. So, if, uh, for example, I collect, uh, if UCLAN, for example, collects the data of the students, it cannot use the same data in order to provide uh, promotional uh, activities. Unless, of course, unless, of course, there is a legal ground, which would be the consent. While collecting data, one must remember that we only collect the data that are relevant to the purpose. So, in that way, we framework how and why we, we use the data. The next important thing is that data must be kept accurate and up to date and be kept as long as are required in order to complete the purpose for which we have collected them for. Once we don't need the data, these need to be deleted. So if I'm going to give you an, uh, an example, uh, consider, for example, the processing of images through a CCTV. The CCTV will collect the image. The reason an enterprise has the CCTV is for the protection of the employees, hence, and, and, and the visitors, hence, it falls under the legal ground that is for the protection of their legal interest. However, the data collected has to be used only for that purpose and for nothing else. And once not needed, they have to be deleted. So if there was no incident within the day the footage was collected for, then we don't need it. We can keep it for a few more days. And let's say that the maximum day time of 15 days, that has to be deleted. So it basically gives you a whole circle of the uh, journey of the data within the business. And it is that circle of data, the cycle, I'm sorry, the cycle of data that you must have in mind uh, every time you consider uh, the journey of the personal data in an enterprise. And that's the theory behind the law. Now, there have been a number of rulings uh, by the commissioner. Stephanie, can I have the next one, please? Thank you. Now, I'm citing here the, some rulings of the commissioner before the GDPR in order to compare them with post-GDPR rulings. Before the GDPR, under the previous legislation, I need to remind you that the maximum fine the commissioner was allowed to impose was 30,000 euro. 
today is over 20 million in certain cases. Now, back then, therefore, CETA, Cyprus Telecommunications Authority, was found guilty and was fined with 30,000 euro because an employee was releasing personal information she had access to as part of her employment to a private investigator. So the commissioner found that outrageous, fined the, uh, the CETA with 30,000 euro. If it was today, it could have been half a million. And if it was today under the current law, that employee would have also been liable, criminally liable, for the fact that he was sharing the information. Another major case back then of 2008, prior to the GDPR, was the case referring to the uh, presidential candidates who were fined because they were sending back SMS to the public promoting their campaign without having a legal reason. They were uh, fined with uh, 1,200 euro to 1,500 euro per complaint. So some of them paid up to accumulatively 30,000 euro. Stephanie, please. Thank you. Another major case prior to the GDPR, and the decision of this case was issued on the 23rd of May of 2018, two days before the GDPR kicked in. A company has been executed unauthorized credit scoring processing on behalf of clients in order to assess the credit standing of individuals. Credit scoring is where is uh, when companies in England credit scoring is legal in Cyprus it is not legal yet but credit scoring is a procedure where our enterprises are profiling an individual and they decide as to whether is eligible for a loan or is eligible for uh, to buy a product and pay it in installments that however to be made to, to be exercised, it should have been exercised through consent and through proper um, uh, and through proper uh, information prior to uh, executing that. Twenty-five thousand five thousand euro was defined uh, there. Moving now to post GDPR um, uh, rulings. Thank you, Stephanie. A very interesting case was the case of the insurance company where a company generated eight digit numbers beginning with 96, 97, 99, and it generated through a software. So if you generate, if you give an order to a software to generate you uh, all the eight digit numbers beginning with 96, 97, 98, you end up with more or less 4 million numbers. They took these 4 million numbers and they sent a bulk SMS to those numbers, telling them that we are the best insurance company in Cyprus and you should move to us. Out of those 4 million, 25,000 messages actually reached a number. A mobile phone number. Out of those 25,000 recipients, nine of them, not 9,000, nine, uh, were, um, did uh, file a complaint with the commissioner. The commissioner argued that there was a breach of personal data. The insurance company argued that what they did did not amount to personal data. Because all they did was to generate numbers. And there was a discussion there, I must admit. It was an interesting discussion because uh, I was the one who was handling the case for the insurance company. And then the commissioner finally decided that from the moment, and you, you have to understand that uh, these decisions of the commissioner are knowledge to us, the practitioners, because they give us 
uh, the, the right knowledge as to how to handle cases further. The commissioner therefore said that from the moment that you are know that a number actually reached a phone number and the phone device, it means that if you take that phone number and you save it on your mobile device and then you open the WhatsApp application or the Viber application or any other chat application, it means that it will most probably bring you up a name and a photo. So that means that through the number, a person may be identified. Therefore, the commissioner acknowledged it, received it as a personal data and fined the insurance company 500 euro for every person that filed a complaint. So it was nine times 500, four and a half thousand euro. Another important case post GDPR was the Macarius Hospital case where a patient's medical file was lost. The commissioner considered it as a data breach and fined them with 5,000 euro. Amy, can I have another one? Thank you. A third important case, there are many cases, there is a quite uh, not rich, but there are an amount of case law um, uh, nowadays, which you can visit on the site of the commissioner. Uh, however, I have chosen the best of 2020 and 2021. Um, it's like the Oscars of, uh, of, uh, of commission decisions. Of course, 2021, we didn't have many because of the COVID. Um, doctor on the Instagram, therefore, uh, the facts were that the doctor published photos of patients after having concluded the cosmetic surgery. The commissioner ruled that it was a breach of the right of privacy because the, uh, the doctor published the photos before and after without the consent of his patient. And uh, therefore, the commissioner fined the, the doctor with 14,000 euro. The greatest fine ever imposed so far uh, in Cyprus uh, was when the commissioner fined a company that has been using an online system for monitoring sick leaves. Uh, the monitoring was quite severe, and the commission ruled that that system was used for monitoring and also for appraisal purposes. And because of the number of employees of that company, they had approximately 800, it fined, it, it placed a fine of 85,000 euro. This case has been uh, uh, challenged in court, and uh, uh, we remain the judge as to what the judge will uh, say about that. And I see that I have uh, a question. Um, I'm reading the question. Maria Farmakalidi is asking, hello, I would like to place a question. Let's say you are processing the personal data of your customer for the following purposes. One, complying with a law, i.e. AML. For those who are not of the profession, AML is the anti-money laundering legislation. Preparation, execution of contracts, and three, on the basis of consent for very specific reasons. A company beside obtaining the consent of the customer after informing through a manual how the company will process their personal data, does the company need to maintain a register in which the responsible person will record every single process of personal data? Well, Maria, thank you very much for your question. Um, the answer is twofold. First of all, um, first of all, um, you need to understand that you need just one legal uh, legal basis. So, if you are processing the data of your client uh, in order to comply with the AML, it's one purpose and it's one legal ground, which is fine. The second purpose would be for the execution of contracts, of agreements, I understand, with your client, which is fine. You don't need consent. You already have a legal ground. You need consent if you're going to uh, use the data for any other reason, either to promote or even 
like Amy said, if you want to share them outside the EU. So that's all you need in order to process. There on, you don't need consent. Um, you have to inform anyhow. You have to inform the client through your privacy statement or the, or the privacy policy, which usually one can found, find on the um, on the website of uh, of the enterprise. Uh, and yes, you need to maintain a register. I understand you mean for the process register, the data flow mapping, as I call it. Yes, you need to maintain that because uh, from the moment that you are offering uh, these kind of services, uh, they are considered to be uh, a systematic and of a large scale processing because the AML is, uh, is so thorough and you are using such tools that it amounts to profiling. So profiling is considered to be of a large scale of processing and therefore, yes, as a company, uh, you need to have uh, a data flow mapping or otherwise a, a register. Um, let me proceed um, to the next slide. Amy. Sorry, um, Stephanie. Thank you very much. The Bank of Cyprus case. The Bank of Cyprus case is a rather new, new, new decision. It was issued back in November uh, 2020. It relates to the scenario where uh, Bank of Cyprus is placed the original insurance agreement of a client. As you may know, Bank of Cyprus also owns Eurolife Insurance Company, which provides insurance uh, uh, coverage uh, on the life sector and the health sector. Uh, a client complained that they wouldn't provide him with the original contract. Despite the bank alleging that the original agreement contract was not lost, since there was no data breach, but it was just misplaced. The commissioner ruled that even the very fact that the bank at the given moment did not know where the agreement was, the original part, is a violation of the bank to apply the necessary technical measures for the protection of personal data. So for the result, for the, the result of the bank not being able to um, uh, not, not be able to identify to find a misplaced agreement was considered to be a data breach. It's very, very similar to the Macarius Hospital case that I mentioned below earlier on. Only at this case, it's 15,000 euro the, the fine, whereas with Macarius uh, Hospital was 5,000 euro. Next and final slide. Uh, I have to say that due to the lockdown, the Office of the Commissioner for Personal Data, for the Protection of Personal Data, did not engage into investigating breaches of the regulation because it didn't have many uh, complaints either. Um, however, uh, it has uh, provided valuable information to the practitioners and to the enterprises through directives through interpretation of GDPR principles and audit questionnaires. Directives are directions the Office of the Commissioner is issuing for sectors of the, uh, of the economy in Cyprus. And let me give you some examples. Uh, it has issued a directive that doctors should maintain the data of their patients for a maximum period of 15 years after the conclusion, after the last visit of the patient to the doctor. It has provided the direction to the insurance companies 
that they have to have, they have to apply a certain policy regarding the management of their physical files. Just like the Bank of Cyprus didn't do that very well, there was a directive for the insurance companies. So Eurolife, Bank of Cyprus through Eurolife, was in breach both of the GDPR and the direction of the commissioner. Uh, the commissioner also issued directions uh, regarding um, the, the fact that uh, insurance companies have to, sorry, uh, schools, uh, private schools, public schools of uh, from elementary up to uh, lyceum, secondary grade, uh, they had to uh, they, they have to uh, perform a data private privacy impact assessment prior prior to engaging in online teaching. That direction later on in January 2021 became a law, and today all schools, private or public, they need even even the 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 institutes where children in the afternoon they go for uh, extracurricular lessons, they have to perform a data privacy impact assessment prior to engaging in online teaching. The third uh, step the commissioner did was to circulate audit questionnaires. So the office engaged into auditing enterprises. It began with food industry, it went on to the insurance industry. Today, 10 days ago, it uh, issued audit questionnaires to the health industry. The audit questionnaires are sent to the enterprises, to related enterprises. There's a deadline to reply to the questionnaire. It, the commissioner asks approximately 180 uh, questions which in order to assess the level of compliance with the GDPR, and uh, they need to re reply within a certain deadline. That audit questionnaire gives also the opportunity to the enterprises to fill in gaps as which are, which are revealed as they answer that questionnaire. So despite the fact that uh, the uh, 2021 was not very rich into case law. However, it was rich into interpretation, directions, and engaging the enterprises to increase or to better or to even comply if they were not complied uh, with the GDPR. Thank you very much, and I am happy to take your questions now. Thank you, Stylianos. Uh, actually, you know, even universities, as you know very, were very well, had to answer a huge questionnaire. I don't know if you remember that. Of a course, few, of course, yes. A few months ago, before the final exams of uh, semester two of last year, uh, we had to engage into that self-assessment exercise. Uh, which I think it was a European-wide complaint by students throughout the European Union as to um, how exams were were held and the fact yes. that you know some exams had to be invigilated and uh, had to be uh, locked uh, lockdown blackboard lockdown in other words you know the computer is blocked and someone is you know intruding into your computer it. basically at a distance so we, we had this as well i'm surprised that you say that there there were not that many complaints during covid i would have expected the amount of complaints to rise rather than decrease well um apparently they were not um maybe it was because of the lockdown uh, even though uh, everybody got more became more digital um, still, uh, there were not uh, that many complaints uh, filed, or at least there were not so many decisions issued. Now, we have a question in the chat from Bandelis, and I'm afraid that we have to move on, no break, because we actually run over time. So Bandelis is saying, well, he's actually asking about a case 
uh, the UBO Luxembourg uh, preliminary reference request before the Court of Justice of the European Union. It's case uh, C37 of 20 uh, that actually sp speaks about the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and GDPR. I'm not sure whether someone is familiar with this case, either uh, Amy or Stilianos. Me neither. Um, I'm not. Uh, Amy? No, no, I'm not. Uh, um, I am not either. However, uh, because Pandeli's question relates to uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and GDPR, um, the only thing I can comment now uh, is that um, uh, protection of personal data is part of the human rights of every individual. And then that is the cornerstone of the creation of the GDPR. The reason the GDPR was created is in order to safeguard the personal data. Safeguarding of the personal data amounts to a human right. Yeah. And it is obviously the obligation, the obligation of the enterprises who collect mm -hmm. the data, to whom the data we actually lend them, when there is a legal reason, as I have mentioned earlier, uh, in order to provide a service or to execute uh, an agreement. There is a follow-up so question. We don't own the data. There was a follow-up question by Bandelis. Actually, there was a prior question uh, by Bandelis. Okay, Bandelis says, you know, thanks for the comment. This could be indeed a very topical issue during 2021. Yeah, we are happy to look into it and uh, see whether it looks like the cake saga, the next cake saga. Very happy. Uh, Bandelis, I'm not sure whether, you know, we are able to also address your other question, which has to do with the DAC6, uh, Belgian preliminary reference request before the Court of Justice of European Union, KC 694 of 2020, again from the point of view of the Charter and GDPR. Probably we need to take this outside of the, of the webinar, unless someone has something to say here. And there was a general question from Angelina. Uh, Angelina, if you don't mind, we'll keep it for the Q&A because it's quite broad, uh, the question. So I think that in terms of program and timing, Stilianos has already covered uh, what was supposed to come next, which is how the COVID pandemic has affected data protection requirements. So we'll give the floor to Amy to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the status of the adequacy ruling for data transfers to UK companies and the status of revisions to the standard contractual clauses for data transfers. The two are linked to each other. Okay, uh, let me see. Let's see. Am I sharing my screen? You, yeah, you are now. Okay, very good. Um, so, as I said, this is a very uh, timely webinar because um, with respect to data transfer to the UK. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, under the, um, under the trade agreement between the EU and UK, there was a bridge period, a grace period for to, to allow data transfers to continue between the EU and the UK under the terms of the GDPR. It was set to expire on the earlier of June 30th or the issuance of an adequacy decision. Um, if, the, if no adequacy decision is issued by June 30th, companies in the UK that are processing uh, EU origin data and companies in the EU that are transferring EU origin data have to have another, um, another mechanism in place. Um, however, last week, the European Commission issued their draft adequacy decision, which is good news. It is now in the review and approval process. 
So assuming that that process is completed by June 30th, uh, we will be able to continue transferring data between the EU and UK as we did before Brexit. So uh, transferring data to the UK will not be deemed to be a transfer outside of, basically the, the UK will be treated on a par with other EU um, recipients because the current UK law is was modeled after the GDPR. Again, adequacy decisions are reviewed every four years, so this is not a permanent issue. And if the UK law diverges from the protections offered by the GDPR, then that adequacy decision can be changed. So it's it's not a permanent solution, but it's a very good first step. Uh, there you can hear links to both the draft adequacy decision and the information commissioner's office uh, statement regarding the adequacy decision. Uh, shall I just go ahead and continue with the OK standard contract? So we talked about the standard contractual clauses, which are now with the with the death of the um, privacy shield, standard contractual clauses are really the primary transfer mechanism for data transfers between the EU and the US, and also between the EU and other state, other countries that are not deemed adequate, such as China. So the, the standard contractual clauses, right now there are two sets of standard contractual clauses, one uh, or, or three, but primarily between um, controller and processor and controller to controller. And they the terms were put in place more than 10 years ago. Uh, the terms cannot be changed. Um, the trouble is that data transfers today are so much more complex than they were 11 years ago. Uh, as I mentioned, once you, once you get into cloud computing, there is an infinite loop of third parties that you are dealing with. And I was responsible for implementing and negotiating data processing agreements that included standard contractual clauses with our large corporate clients and as well as with our vendors. Um, and um, it's, <laughs> There's a big disconnect between what the what the contract clauses say and what is feasible to do. So, for example, uh, getting the data controller's consent for any change in the third parties that we use to process the data. Um, you know, Microsoft supposedly needs to get the consent of all of its gazillion customers every time they change a third party that happens to support part of Azure. Um, so companies are putting in place mechanisms that really weren't, I think, anticipated when the standard contractual clauses were created. So um, on November 12th, the European Commissioner proposed finally issued some proposed revisions to the standard contractual clauses, which have been in process for several years and were accelerated by the Schrems II decision. I applaud the changes that try to make the process more modular because one of the things we found is that in our relationship with just one other party, often for some of the data, we were joint controllers for some of the data they were the controller, we were the processor for other data. You know, we were the, or it was vice versa. So, so um, the, the old, the old, the current standard contractual clauses are, are very, very uh, clunky. So the new, the new proposed standard contractual clauses are modular. They have a docking system. So to make it easier to add more subprocessors to the agreement. Um, practically, that causes 
I, I can I see this this massive web of companies docking to the Microsoft standard contractual clauses or the Amazon standard contractual clauses. And if you, as a technology provider, are docked to both of those, um, they're going to be inconsistent. <laughs> Uh, the, the processing agreements, the standard contractual clauses themselves can't be modified, but the agreements that they are incorporated in are going to be different. So we have this whole mechanism is creating a check the box. Um, it, it, I predict it what I've seen in the past is it creates a check the box mentality. Oh yeah, we have standard contractual clauses in place. Doesn't mean that companies manage them or are aware of them or comply with them. So it's a, it's a box checking exercise, which is unfortunate because that's not, that's not accomplishing uh, the goal. Um, with these proposed, the proposal is that there will be a one year grace period after the new standard contractual clauses are, are released formally. Um, and by the end of that one year period, all prior standard contractual clauses have to be replaced. Uh, it was a massive effort for us to get standard contractual clauses in place with all of our customers and vendors. So if if you are working with a client that has standard contractual clauses in place, make sure that they are aware that when these new clauses are officially released, there is going to be probably going to be a short runway to implement them. Um, there are a number of objections that were filed to them, and I recommend actually reading the objections because it it gives a really good uh, indication of where the pain points are with these new clauses. Um, some of the issues are that they impose terms over and above current GDPR requirements. They, they really are reflective of the guidelines that the European Data Protection Board issued for supplemental uh, measures to take. Um, there are data subjects become third party beneficiaries of all of these agreements so there's a lot of concern um, that the processors will need to have direct contact with the data subjects not necessarily all going through the data exporter there's a lot of confusion about that um, some of the comments suggest that the Obligations put on the data importer are disproportionate. Uh, there's no balancing of legitimate interests. So those are the, the nature of the uh, concerns that were raised. You can, um, you can read the draft uh, decision as well as the feedback. I do recommend looking at the feedback uh, to understand what, what may be coming down the pike. So in the meantime, uh, I, as Stiliano said, the, the fundamental step is map your data, know what data is going where, including if it's going to outside the EU. Um, you need to identify all agreements that are current that currently include standard contractual clauses, and you need to stay aware because once once the new clauses are released, there's going to be a limited period. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, so it's we are right on time. Perfect. It's eight o'clock. Uh, before I uh, I ask you to wrap up, uh, Tiliane, is there something you want to add on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected data protection requirements? Or have you covered everything? Well, I could. Um, there was a joke the other day on LinkedIn. It said, uh, "Who is who is responsible for your day for your company's digital transformation?" And it had some options. It was saying the CEO, the CFO, um, the, the the IT uh, manager, and the last one was COVID. So um, COVID did made us made all of us digital. 
um, a year ago we didn't know what the teams uh, was we didn't know what the webinar is so um, the, the fact COVID did bring us closer to digitalization did bring everybody closer to technology um, but uh, that's where all the enterprises need to understand that they cannot just take advantage if I may say the word of digitalization they have also comply uh, with their obligations towards digitalization because it's a totally different world out there and um, to a certain extent nobody can predict as to how bad uh, a situation may go and uh, adding on a comment that amy said that uh, a lot of enterprises they use the standard contractual clauses just to tick the box which is unfortunate because there is value there. I have to say that uh, following uh, complete compliance of uh, under my uh, supervision and guidance of my team of over 70 to enterprises in Cyprus, uh, from schools to universities to um, to hospitals to insurance companies, I must say that even in Cyprus. Um, to, a, to, a, to some extent, a lot of the enterprises, they just take the deliverables and they just keep them somewhere. And when you ask them, where is the data flow mapping? Uh, to, who's, to whose email did you send it? Uh, where is the privacy uh, policy? Uh, I think I gave it to that guy who is that guy. And so you understand that still we're kind of, not everybody, of course, uh, we're not so mature yet. Uh, as entrepreneurs into this uh, data protection. Just that. Yeah, I think the, the whole field of information governance, I was banging the drum very unsuccessfully <laughs> to get any, um, any traction when I was in-house to manage data um, and, and really look at the whole data life cycle cycle and data minimization and a culture of you don't need to keep every single email. Um, data mm -hmm. governance is is a huge cultural shift and, and really taking ownership of what you have, what you collect and what you do with it, how you protect it is a is a major cultural shift. It is and mind you that you're talking about information you know, information governance. I mean, nowadays here in Cyprus, uh, most of the enterprise didn't really have to implement the provisions of the GDPR. Uh, be, uh, they, they are doing the compliance, the design part, the implementation, which means to go down to their where to their storage rooms and find all those files from 19 God knows when and take them out and shred them. Uh, there's still quite a long way. However, however, I have to say that uh, they are more cautious about data, they worry about GDPR, people is alerted, um, and uh, things are, uh, are moving on nicely um, since 2018. So that's a yeah, new, it, whole new world. After corporate it, governance, then we have the world of data and information governance. And, uh, of course, of course. Yes. Amy, you wanted to add something. No, I was just I was just going to say I agree, um, Silianos, and especially in the U.S., the GDPR was a huge wake up mm. call, um, and it it really led to certainly the California changes, the changes in California law. Um, it 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 was a very good um, <laughs> impetus for U.S. companies to start paying attention to privacy, which they really had not. Mm. Probably it's true for, you know, a lot of uh, businesses located in the European Union anyway. It's probably true as well. Now, on our program, now we actually have a wrap up and some sort of uh, assessment or some sort of, you know, uh, reflection. And then we will have Q&A. So, would you, the two of you want to wrap up very briefly and then we will open the floor. Sure. Um, so I guess my takeaways are number one, know your data, know what you have, where it's going, how you use it. Try to limit the data that you collect 
and transfer. So really focus on data minimization. Do you really need to collect that data? You know, if you put a Facebook like button on your website, you are now a joint controller with Facebook for the data that is collected there. How important is that like button for you? you know, make sure that every data collection point is evaluated for what is the value, how, how, what is our legitimate interest in collecting this information and is it worth the cost to us of managing that information and the risks that having that information provides, do we get more benefit from that? So, so really do a benefit cost analysis. Um, can you keep the data in the EU? Um, I don't know how feasible that is for, for so much of our, our data transfers, but if you can keep it in the EU, that's good. If it's going to go to the US, you are safer transferring it to a US affiliated entity in the EU, which is ironic that US to US transfers are more protected under the FISA than non-US to US. It, it's abundantly clear that transfers of data between two US persons, US corporations, are have the highest level of protection. Um, stay tuned. Uh, consider upping your specialty in privacy. It's a, it's a huge, huge market for you. And watch for developments in privacy tech. Those would be my takeaways. Very sound advice. Thank you so much, Amy. Stiliane, do you have any, any tips to add to that? Well, um, I think Amy covered me 100%. I just need to advise on one thing. Um, get to know GDPR. Get trained. It's not difficult. It's nothing really to worry about. It's something that will be in our lives forever. Uh, so get educated. It, it's going to help you um, personally, professionally, everything. Thank you very much both. We now have about 10 minutes for questions. Now there was one in the chat, which I'm going to read to you, but I think that you have answered it uh, broadly. However, it's from a student, so there may be things that are not clear to students yet from Angelina. And Angelina was uh, asking uh, about uh, le the legitimate purpose of collecting data. If, if you could expand on what constitutes a legitimate purpose for collecting data. Stylianos has uh, listed them very clearly, uh, I have to say, for Cyprus. But maybe we can give a more, a little bit, uh, you know, a, 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 a more, uh, a broader view as to how do you do that balancing exercise? Yeah. I don't know um, who wants to answer. Um. I can begin. Uh, let, let, let me just find the question of uh, yes, Angelina. Um, Angelina, hi. Um, well, you are not mistaken. Yes, um, it's an it's it's a balanced three element test which has to be balanced. We take into consideration the purpose, the necessity, and the balance. So, how this works in a practical approach? Um, and that is done in your mind when you assess as to what you collect. And the result is done on the, in your mind is because you must have prior, prior to that uh, mapped everything on your data flow mapping. So basically, you have an idea uh, as to why you collect everything. But yes, we took we take into consideration the purpose. <clears throat> it needs to fit the purpose, and it has to be the necessary for the purpose nothing more nothing more than that so the purpose and the necessity they go together they have to match each other the balance now relates to the uh, to the impact that data has on the uh, data subject in case there is uh, a data breach so for example uh, i need to consider myself do i really need 
that data for this purpose because if I keep this data and I lose it, the impact on the on the uh, data subject will be worse than the fact that I actually want to use them on his own uh, for his own sake. And uh, uh, it's it's always good to to have that test in mind. And it's always nice that Angelina knows about this uh, three element test because it means that there is some depth there. So if I could give some some concrete examples. So um, we looked at what information are we collecting? Is our sales team collecting about our customers? What are we retaining? Where are we retaining it? How are we using it? When do we get rid of it? So legitimate interest. Um, we need to know the contact name and business phone number and business contact information and role of our, our primary customer contacts uh, so that we can reach them if there's an issue, so that we can confirm that if we get a support call, it's, it's a, coming from an authorized source. Um, that kind of information is necessary for us to provide the services that the customer requested. Uh, what we don't necessarily need, but salespeople like to collect, <laughs> is their cell phone number, their home number, their home address, their spouse's name, their spouse's favorite wine, their religion, their gender orientation, the names of their kids. You know, that we don't have a legitimate interest in collecting and retaining that kind of information. And that kind of information could be very uh, much more problematic if it gets breached. And as a cybersecurity company, I can tell you that you should never assume that you have not been breached. <laughs> you probably have been breached. You just don't know it yet. So when you think of collecting information, understand you, you need to work from an assumed breach um, standpoint. Thank you very much, both. This is very sound advice in life anyway, whether you know you, you're a lawyer or whether you're just a simple uh, consumer and a user of social media. I think it's uh, it's very, very valid uh, advice. Can I ask whether there are any more questions either in the chat or you're welcome to uh, unmute yourselves and uh, say a few words? I see that Angelina is saying thank you. You're very welcome. Any of the lawyers, any of the professionals here who would have a question? No? Okay. Well, in that case, we will actually uh, bring it to a close a little bit earlier than, than planned, uh, which is fine. Uh, our speakers, uh, do you have any last word to ha to add? No, uh, stay stay tuned. <laughs> it's changing all the time. Um, I, I look forward to seeing how we in the technology industry um, can evolve <laughs> because we we are dealing with. Um, very, very important human rights and um, systems that can't really protect those human rights the way that we are currently doing business. Amy, we're very happy to have you. You know, we appreciate your uh, many, many years of experience and the fact that uh, you're still, uh, you know, hanging around with us and uh, showing patience. <laughs> to for us to understand basic issues in the US. <laughs> so we're very, very, very grateful to you and also very grateful to Stilianos, who is a very busy professional. So we are grateful for his time as well. The time he spends with us also uh, indicate, uh, educating us. And uh, we're happy to see that, you know, we had a good number of uh, people in attendance, uh, lawyers, but also students. So that's very good. Uh, Andrea is kindly reminding everyone, guys, that uh, in the files section of the MS Teams classroom, 
there is a feedback form which uh, we would like to ask you to fill in. If it's possible, please, this is for our purposes and it's required by the Cyprus Bar Association as well. There is a final, final question in the chat from Angelina who says, how can we apply a legitimate purpose to special category data? What sort of special category uh, is she referring to? I'm not sure. Um, I, I know. Um, um, the, the, the GDPR says that for the processing of special category data, which it could be the health data, it could be biometric data, it could be the fact that an employee is a member of trade union, it, any data that reveals political, uh, sexual, um, uh, preferences, um, social, uh, ethnical, ethnic uh, origins, uh, those are the special data. And the law says, the GDPR says, that an extra second uh, legitimate uh, ground needs is needed, which is the consent. Not always, um, uh, with the exception of uh, medical cases and in employment law. But other than that, for example, the insurance companies, when they are uh, collecting the data from their uh, clients in order to offer them insurance coverage, let's say life insurance or health insurance, it goes without saying that if they're going to offer health insurance, they have to know about their health background. Still, the fact that the client is uh, providing details about their uh, about his health uh, data, which then the company will process in order to provide the insurance company. And there is a purpose. Still, the client has to tick the box, providing the consent for the um, for the processing of the special data. And that is uh, it falls under the principle of transparency that the GDPR wants to promote. Um, the insurance companies in Cyprus were not very happy about it, but almost three years down the road, um, they have accepted it. Thanks, Tilianos. I think she was referring to a particular category of uh, data. So now she wrote in the chat, for example, biometric. Uh, data which could give indication as to the ethnicity of someone. Uh, but I think you've covered, I mean... The, yes, the, the, yes, 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 it's the same answer. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, the enterprise collecting this kind of data yeah. uh, needs to be, needs to provide uh, or needs to obtain, uh, apart from the, needs to, apart from ma the main legitimate reason, it needs also to obtain consent. Correct. And if I could just add, yeah, if I could just add something on that, in the U.S., currently one state has a very, very protective law regarding collection of biometric information. That's Illinois, um, and there are many, many cases. Again, it's a lawyer full employment act. <laughs> many uh, cases regarding the collection of biometric data of Illinois residents without their express consent. Oh, it's it's yeah. a law that that. Um, it was actually passed, I think, in 2013. It was ahead of its time. So much, I mean, and, you know, login screens that you can do with your fingerprint or your face is collecting biometric data. This law, um, again, does not fit how we're using technology today. I understand the, the reasoning behind it, but there's a big mismatch between the legal requirements and how we're how we're doing business. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, the comparative uh, perspective between the EU and the US is so useful in the field of privacy and data protection. I think it has uh, really come to the, fore to the forefront. I mean, it's always been useful, but this specific area of the law is, uh, is, is uh, necessary. It's indispensable to be able to compare between the EU and the US. So that has brought us closer to US experts and US scholarship in that field. So this is uh, this is very good. 
Well, we are now uh, at the end of the webinar, so I'm going to thank everyone, our speakers, our colleagues who've been helping with uh, the, the, the smooth functioning of, of the webinar. As you can see, we are not uh, free from uh, technical issues. <laughs> so thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Costas, for solving everything for us. Thank you, everyone, for um, uh, attending. Apparently, lots of people have found it very useful, and uh, we even have requests for um, some more. So we will think about that and uh, come back with some more suggestions. In the meantime, we wish you a good evening, pleasant evening, and to Amy, a very good day. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Steph Stephanie, do you have my slides? or? Do you do I need to send them, post them? I do have your slides. Yes, okay, I do. Good. We place them in the MS Teams so that people good. can collect them from there. Perfect. Thank you very Perfect. much, everyone. Okay. You Thank take you. care. Thank you. Have a good day, Amy. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.